All right, everybody, what is going on? We are live officially at 7 o'clock Central Time, and we got a whole bunch of people on. Eager people wanting to learn more about their electronics. I get it. Uh, they're not cheap these days, but, man, I tell you what, you can definitely get a bunch out of your investment. Uh, we got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get through it right away. We'll go through everything again. If you're just signing on, I already kind of went through this, but please, please uh, – send in your questions you can see a little question there don't use the chat i won't see the chat but i'll definitely go through questions at the end of the webinar try to address as many of them as i absolutely can but uh big time i want to, want to thank everybody for coming on this is utilizing maps and lawrence electronics josh douglas flw tour pro and i'm a bit of a lawrence guru electronics guru i love staring at them um i can spend i swear just as much time looking at my grass as i can actually catching them i absolutely love it so uh, let's get this thing rolling. All right. I start out all of my seminars, webinars, anything that I'm doing with electronics. I always start them out with uh, this slide right here. When, prep, when preparation meets opportunity. I can't tell you how important that really is. Um, I started out a shallow water fisherman. I did well doing it. About 10 years ago, I got into uh, bass fishing and into tournament bass fishing. And, you know, I hit the bank. I hit the bank hard. I got good at skipping docks, at flipping wood, even flipping grass and stuff that I saw. But uh, there's a whole world of stuff offshore. My good bed buddy, Brent Hames, lives down on the river. Really kind of instilled that in me when I was getting going in this thing that there's so much stuff behind me. Then I got to figure that out. And instead of just searching out one bass, maybe you can look for a whole school. And you'll see here, I'm going to try to use this cursor a bunch. Hopefully you guys can see it. And uh, you see here, there's just a big point here on my Nabionics map. And there's a school of bass, and that's what it turned out to be, a big old fat smallmouth. Uh, I'm going to start out with some advanced Navionics mapping options that I'm not sure how many people know about. I know basically everyone that I know utilizes the Navionics uh, app for their telephone, uh, for, their, uh, for their iPhone, Android, um, iPad, stuff like that. I use one. I'm going to run an iPad this year on, on my new boat. comes in next week. So I can utilize some of these functions. Being Navionics is just a mapping company. They don't actually own um, any kind of the electronics like Lowrance or Humminbird, Raymer, anything like that. So they put a lot of these features until uh, those companies decide they want to bring a feature on and add it to their chart plotters. Uh, you have them all available to you right there on an iPad or iPhone. First one I'm going to show you one I use all the time. Um, when, when you go onto the map, you just basically got to go to menu and then map options. You'll see menu in the bottom right. Once the app opens up, you'll see map options as your option right here. Hit those options and that'll bring you to water level offset. Uh, water level offset, I use it all the time. Uh, not so much up here in Minnesota. Our water doesn't fluctuate all that much. I mean, I guess the Mississippi River does, but uh, we're a lot of natural lakes. Um, but anytime I leave this state, and I'm dealing with reservoirs and you know fluctuating water, and it can really be confusing sometimes when you show up to a lake and you've got you know you're, it's 10 feet high or it's 10 feet low, stuff like that. I just got home from Sam Rayburn; it was three feet low. You know, not a big deal. I, I could get past that, but when you start looking at some of those lakes like Douglas Lake in Tennessee, it fluctuates. I think up to 30, maybe even 40 feet at times. It can be really confusing when you're looking at your map. So I always utilize utilize water level uh sorry i always utilize water level offset on my app on my phone or on my ipad and it's pretty simple water level you just go right here you can see in this middle one right here that that's at zero if you look down it's kind of showing you what it'll look like over here i i inflated it, I, I bumped it up they got a lot of rain and now this lake's 12 feet high and over here on the right side it's 12 foot low so it just kind of distorts all the contours and lets me look at things without you know if i know my fish are in 20 25 feet that i'm targeting I, I can find that real easy by using water level offset. Uh, utilizing fishing ranges. This is fun. Obviously, I did not make this slide. Uh, my wife, Bree, did. She's very, very good at this kind of stuff. But this is an awesome new tool. I love the color patterns that they use for this. Uh, I use it all the time. You know, and, and basically, it's again, it's another function you can see on here. The, the one here on the left is showing basically we started it out at 30 feet. Next one is 20 feet, and the next one is 10 feet. Uh, changing the colors, I pick different colors for different contour lines, and that's going to be your end result down here is going to be, again, if you look back at these ones, you can see the different tones of colors showing me different hard spots. There's a little high spot right here, 
and all that. And you just kind of go through, it helps me read things a little bit better. Again, I'm gonna have that iPad at my face so that I can utilize these functions. And you all can too, the app's like 10, 15 bucks for your phone, 50 bucks for your pad. And uh, I use it all the time, using my hotel rooms, or I should say my Lance Camper now, I use it at home. And a uh, great way to study maps, all that is using the maps. Map reading. Map reading is super duper important. I talk about it all the time. The contours, I mean, my Lawrence units, they'll find everything. I can sniff anything out. I swear I can find it, but I need my map to first know where I'm going to go to find some. Otherwise, I am literally guessing. The water all looks the same from the top. So utilizing your map is very important. And some of the different things you can see is like, here's a creek channel. This is uh, Sam Rayburn Reservoir. My boat right here just came over this creek channel, and you can see all the life that's on that actual channel there on my sonar to the right. Utilizing tools like these to find these kind of creek channels, uh, big time important, maybe over here where the creek channel bumps a point. That could be something, you know, a good point when those fish are staging to move in. Um, definitely something that I use. Again, with contour is so important. You're talking about hard bottom. Uh, you need contour there. I've always used this as a reference, but if I build a, a sand castle and then the tide comes up, the tide's going to flatten out that ice castle like it never ever happened. It's going to be a bowling effect, and that's what happens with water as the waves move all around with the north wind, south wind, east and west. It'll bowl everything. Now, if I took that right where that sand castle was when the tide was back down, I put a rock there or a couple bricks, and the tide comes back up and the tide goes back down, those bricks are still going to be there because they're hard. Um, that creates hard bottom. So finding contour, sharp contour changes, stuff like that. In this case, here's an old road bed that goes underneath, uh, goes swoops right across this bay. And you can see it right on the right. It just comes up hard. Over time, the water can't move that. So finding my mapping, uh, I do a lot of electronics training. It still baffles my brain how people uh, aren't utilizing one foot contours stuff like that to be able to actually find places to start. You know, you got a bass brain, you got a walleye brain, whatever it is, you know how to go and find those fish. You know what they like. The contours will show you places to start. This, here's a road bed. Here's another couple road beds. Again, uh, I use Navionics mapping. It's awesome. Here you can see on this side, I'm, I'm literally just idling up and I'm keeping that road bed there on my right hand side. And here's the screenshot image of it on my side imaging down scan. You can see this road bed just easing through here. Perfect. As I move down, uh, you can also find sweet spots on these. Here's my, here's another screenshot. I cross over a road bed and looking on my left, it says on my Navionics map, there's a submerged bridge. Here's that exact same screenshot. As I idle past it, you can see where the creek channel came and went right underneath that bridge. Uh, here's your road bed right here, hard bottom bridge. People put brush piles all around it. That is a sweet spot. That's a stop sign. Again, my map brought me right to there. I launched my boat, ran right to it. Uh, introducing sonar chart live. This is something I play with a bunch. I use it uh, on lakes. You know, up here in Minnesota, we have 10,000, 13,000 strong lakes all over the place. Probably never see mapping. Some of them are tiny. Uh, at the same time, I also utilize it on places like Lake Mille Lacs or Lake Erie in Canada, fishing up by Pelee Island, trying to find those contours of those glacier lakes. You know, when those Glaciers moved in and then they retreated. They just left piles of rocks, and that's what created a lot of these reefs that we fish today. Um, you can chart, you can chart it. Map companies can go up and down it, uh, but they'll never get every little nook and cranny on that thing. It, it, the best way to do it is just do it yourself. And I can do that with Sonar Chart Live now with my Lawrence unit. All I'm doing is overlaying. You can see down here in the bottom right, where I overlay my Sonar Chart Live, and I just go to work, and that stays right there on my unit until this is my end result. And you can see, I mean, the map was good before. The map's great now, and that's what I could do myself. If there's a ledge that I really like in Kentucky Lake when I took third, I literally, I just got right on those couple ledges. I knew where those little sweet spots were. I knew where that little kickout was, where those fish were first pulling off the spawn, literally still had bloody tails coming out to that deep water, and they're sitting there and getting it together before they moved up to eat. And my map can show me all that, and it's real easy to use for all Lawrence people. All you got to do Again, just have a, an updated Navionics map. Make sure your software is updated. Uh, came out six, seven months ago, something like that, maybe even a little, little longer than that, and utilize that with your maps. Make your own. It stays right on the unit. You can upload that to Sonar Charts. You can share that and then also utilize other people's and really make yourself a super HD mapping, uh, one-foot contours. It's awesome. 
uh, customizing for efficiency. Okay, this is kind of my setup and how I like to use it. I'm going to utilize all of these at my face at all times. Okay, I'm fortunate enough I can run two graphs at my face. I see a lot of people do these days. If you can, it's cool. You can still split up a Lorenz uh, four different ways and all that. But what I want to see in front of me at my face at all times is I need to see my map. I need to see a traditional sonar down scan. There's no replace for either one of them. And of course, my side imaging. Uh, my side imaging shows me so much. Rarely am I actually looking for fish. Of course, I see a lot of fish. Fish helps. We're going to cover a lot of that today. But most of the time, I'm looking for their home, where it is that they live. Uh, good stuff like that. You can see here, you know, this big rock sitting off of this reef drop. There it is again. Here with my map. And over here, you got just a random fish that's swimming through. Looks like a spotted bass fishery to me. But again, every, all the screenshots you're going to see are coming off my front graph generally, right in front of my face. Every now and then you'll see it off one of my units up front. Uh, I'm not going to get into too many basics today. I'm assuming a lot of people that are logging on here already know a lot of the basics and they're looking for some advanced stuff. Uh, but I do want to kind of cover some of the stuff with, with some basic stuff. So we're seeing this with side imaging. Basically, if you imagine you're, you're in a dark room, lights are off, shut off, and you have two flashlights like this and you're walking through the room and you're illuminating everything that you come through that that uh those flashlights that's how you're gonna see it if you can't see behind something it's because there's a shadow there uh, if you look here to the left this would be roughly where my boat engine would be and this is my freshest data coming off of back by my transom here's my freshest reading right here uh, these are boulders bigger rocks sitting out there and you can see the shadowing you know if 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 I'm if I'm scanning that and I'm going to light up one side of the boulder, but I can't see what's behind there. So angles are so super duper important. I'm constantly idling back and forth looking at stuff. Uh, sometimes maybe I'll even blow it out. I idle it so much. I just get to know the area. I'll come back later on uh, with Lawrence again. They don't miss nothing even on down scan. So here I split this rock in half. That's the same rock. It's just literally right underneath the boat. Um, but I can see it on both sides because I went right over the actual top of it. You know, here's rocks, stuff like that. Um, that's basically what I'm looking at when I'm looking at a side imager. Contrast. All of, everyone always asks me when they buy my boats, when they do electronics training with me, or just ask me questions at the boat ramp. Everyone wants to know my settings. Uh, I'm a Lawrence user. I, I basically keep my settings uh, exactly the way they come when I open it up out of the box. There's a couple little things I might tweak. Um, stuff like that I might um, but as, as most part the only thing that I really get into and change right away is my contrast on my side and my side imaging uh, basically what you want to do is everyone's used to photos these days you can blow an image out um, you know at too much light in this situation right here my contrast is way too high um, both of them I can't I can't see very good I'm, I'm whitening out everything I'm making making it ping back a little bit too strong uh, ideally, you want a nice contrast setting right around here. I take it out of auto and I just play with it. And I'm, I'm playing with it every day, basically. I, I sit there and I move it back. It might just be a degree or two uh, percentage change that, that I like, but every lake's a little bit different. How I'm viewing things might be a little bit different that day with the sun, stuff like that. So I'm constantly just, you know, playing with my contrast. Again, not constant, but maybe daily. Every day I'm out there, I'm just kind of tapping my contrast up back and forth so it, it fits my eyes that day the way I want to see it with my sunglasses on and uh, again that's you kind of play with that setting so you get a nice you want to see them whites but you don't want to see too much white you know in this case you can kind of see here as I came off uh, as I come off of this drop right here well here's those contours that we were talking about hard bottom otherwise it would bowl out just like this right here instead you kind of got this nice sharp imaging I came off of those rocks, sand, and now I'm working my way into, into more of the basin and muck. So just my contrast setting, I take that thing out, out of auto, and from there I just kind of switch it around. The other setting that I like to switch is going to involve my traditional sonar. I do leave all my sensitivity, all that kind of stuff, I leave it right in auto. It's perfect. You can't mess with Lorant sonar. It's awesome, but I do change the palette. I changed to palette 13 uh, when I select my sonar palette, and here's why: shell hard bottom. That's that's shell right there. It shows me hard bottom so so well. Um, same image down below. You can kind of see where the rocks are and stuff like that. And that little shell bed, I wouldn't have caught that shell bed on down scan, but I can catch it with that palette. And as I idled over it, I can see it's showing me them greens, 
them yellows, them oranges, them really dark colors indicate really, really hard bottoms. So I changed my palette to 13 and that helps. If here's, here's putting it in even more layman terms for you. Uh, here's a big old rock. You can see the rocks that I was looking at on my side imager. And this is a great way here. Again, if you're running one unit, how you can split your screen up. Uh, but again, these boulders, here's that rock. Here it is there. And you can just, oh, let me go back real quick. Sorry about that. There's that boulder right here that we see here, that bigger rock. And these are all these rocks that we're going over right there. Compared to a, a shell rock, it just shows me that stuff so much better. This one I love. This is standard palette one right here as a Lowrance comes. I see most people use that palette. Uh, I like it around weeds and stuff like that. When I'm fishing grass, I, I generally leave it palette one. But anytime outside of that, I switch it to palette 13. And even now, in all honesty, I just keep it 13. I, I know what I'm looking at. But if here I ran by this hump right here or this, this bar, whatever you want to call it, pile, this, this hump basically, idled over the top of it. And you really can't see much of a difference. Obviously, like what I told you before with contour, it has to be somewhat hard. I mean, it's it's still sitting up and, and the water can't knock it down. But if you look at pallet 13 here on the bottom and that just lit it up on that side, that's where the shell bed's sitting. That's the front side of the current where the current is sweeping across there, keeping it real clean. And those fish like to hang out on there. Again, pallet 13, just an awesome setting. Uh, we'll talk about some marking some fish before we're just going to jump right into interpretation and we're going to roll through it and start getting into everybody's questions. Uh, marking fish, everyone wants to know about marking fish. Of course, I want to see fish. I get pretty excited. I'm as confident with my electronics as I am if I'm seeing them through my amphibious sunglasses. I mean, I, I if I see a bass, I feel like I can catch it. Well, that's exactly how I feel on my electronics, except for I feel even more like I can catch it because chances are they don't know that I'm there. And in these images, they come different ways here that you can actually see the um, that you can actually see the fish. But here's a couple on the bottom. It actually looks like two to me because it's split right there. Um, here's one just coming up, going back down. Here's two spots just up, kind of doing what spotted bass do, uh, coming up and checking out the boat. Uh, this is fish on traditional sonar again on a pal 13. Um, you know, each one of these are bass and. When I'm doing electronics training for people, I was there, man. I just needed somebody over my shoulder. I have countless hours, thousands of dollars in gas that I've spent uh, trying to learn this kind of stuff. And really, I kind of had the idea, but just didn't always have the confidence. I was going over stuff that probably was bass, and I just uh, didn't really have the confidence that that was what it was. Really, what I needed was somebody over my shoulder just to tap me on the back and say, yep, you got it. You're right. Would have definitely shortened my learning curve, and that's what I'm trying to do. For everybody here if you see something you have an idea of what bass want to go to if you're a walleye fisherman you have an idea of what walleye want to hang on musky everything's the same if nothing is underneath it and it's not connected to the bottom it's a fish that's what it's going to be you know it could be like little fish like this and you can pick up clutter you know i leave my screen i don't like to clean up the clutter because i want to see everything i've learned to ignore all this stuff up here you know it's just surface clutter me idling back and forth uh, I got my power poles back there. I got a lot of disturbances in the water. That's all that is a surface clutter. I can't think of many times that I'm generally idling around looking for a bass in that first couple feet of the water column. I mean, it's generally not what they do. Uh, they do suspend, but again, I'm generally not going to be able to pick them up up in them first few feet. So here you go. You got four bass. This might even be one right here, depending on how I turn the boat or came onto them, but definitely four smallmouth sitting there. They look like they're in the fighting position to me. Uh, if they're not on the bottom, you know, again, I use a hydro wave, a bunch, anything I can do to try to stimulate the environment and get those fish to get off the bottom. You can see if you were to take this bass right here and just put him down on the bottom, I wouldn't be able to separate him off of that. I, I can't tell he's there. I have no bottom separation at all. No target separation because the rocks are going to be harder than the fishes themselves. So anytime I can get them up off the bottom, all the better. Down scan and side imaging. Side structure scan, down scan. I mean, here you're looking at it. This is actually, ignore this. This right here is a prop of somebody else that's uh, right alongside me, I believe. Eh, I don't know exactly how that works. Yeah, and that's that's exactly somebody's uh, uh, prop idling next to me. But you can see these fish here on side imaging. They just stick out, and you can see them same fish down here on down scan. Uh, down scan will give me a little bit better target separation um, than that of traditional sonar. Uh, definitely will. And, um, you know, down, I use them both 
sonar is more real time right now. So I still utilize sonar a lot when I'm up on my deck, but when I'm idling around and I'm using the boat down scan, I'll definitely pick them up a, a bunch better. Uh, you know, here's the same. This is just a split screen here. I was at Lake Travis. It looks like, uh, Here's two bass right here. You can almost see their tails. It looks so good. And this is the, those same bass, but with sonar. So you can kind of see the difference. You know, I can't tell which way these fish are moving and which way they came from. I guess if I'm calling these their tail, they're probably going that way. But at the same time, I can tell by these how they react to the boat. I can watch them come up. I can watch them go down for baits. So all kind of different type of stuff, but basically same type of deal. This is more your traditional arc that we all look for. Again, not attached to the bottom kind of gets more hard in the body range of the fish right in here and those are definitely fish and i urge people too when you're out there put down scan right next to your traditional sonar and start getting familiar because it's the same shot you're just looking down it'll definitely but you know we get up here and i tend to ignore some of this stuff uh could be bait could be perch up up higher uh could just be surface clutter turnover stuff like that different types of stuff in the water but to me those look like like some sort of a bait fish up higher again you can't see these big uh, yellow cones and all that that the yellows that bounce back in there. So they're probably a smaller fish Interpretation easily my favorite part of these webinars these seminars uh, is going through and showing you real life Now, you know my settings, you know how I like to have it set up It's pretty turnkey exactly the way you get it out of the box. I don't got nothing else fancier than the equipment itself and I'm going to go through different scenarios as I see them. I'm a screenshot junkie. I'm constantly taking pictures uh, or taking screenshots out there of the cool stuff that I see uh, while I'm on the water. I spend a lot of time out there, and I get to see a lot of pretty cool things, and I want to share them with you. First thing, locating an active environment. Whether you're fishing shallow or you're fishing deep, you always need to have an environment around. Uh, bait, hugely important. Fish, anything that I can see while I see them with my eyes, uh, or while I'm looking at my graph, it's all the same. And in this case, you can see some big submerged trees here and big old bait balls right here. It looks like right here, they, they're probably bass up in here, eating these baits, move, moving the baits around, splitting them all up, just like you see on Nat Geo when you're watching dolphins and sharks attack. Schools of bait fish, they get right in there, they split up the schools, and, and that's exactly what we're looking right at right there, a hungry bass eating. Environments are important. Somebody asked me something about St. Clair in an email. Uh, yeah, St. Clair confused the crap out of me this year, too, when I was there. It was my first time there, my first day, and yeah, it was probably pretty terrible. I'm a smallmouth fisherman. I'm a rock fisherman. I like to go around and look for rocks, and I could never put two rocks together. It's a giant sand bowl. Talk about zero contour like what we were talking about before, and you got yourself St. Clair. It is a bowl. There's really nothing much hard out there. Uh, at all besides that shipping channel for the most part it's a lot of sand it's a lot of vegetation um, once i figure out start using some of that vegetation as as if it was uh rock piles and stuff like that i started to get a lot more successful and again it's about finding these environments if you look right here the grass is just coming up we got a little bit of taller grass here let's take a bit of small mouth general rule of thumb um, large mouth like weeds because they can't see very good they have a lateral line they ambush prey like a mountain lion uh, Smally spots they have eyes. They don't get in the vegetation that much. They can see really really good now They will use the vegetation. They'll hit up get on the edges of it If it's cabbage and stuff like that and it's sparse and rock pile underneath They'll move right through it looking for crawdads and stuff But they'll definitely use these bigger longer stalks of cabbage and stuff like that to sit by and uh, Out here you just got a ton of perch, you know it Looks like maybe that whiter dot right there is probably a small mouth couple smallies and then this cloud is right there is definitely perch uh, here we got largemouth on a ledge. Here's a big ledge. You got a stump out here on the ledge You got some hard bottom on it and it breaks away and goes into the river channel And again, I'm just looking for an environment, you know I idle, idle this and I see these fish sitting up there suspended I see some off here off of the drop on the bottom this smallmouth on a reef I actually remember when I found this spot it was a, a tournament on Mille Lacs this year with my good buddy Joe Willer uh, He was in his boat. I was in mine. I was all idling around. I never even knew this rock pile existed uh, never never saw it before in my entire life. I idled it. That's what it looked like. I made one cast, caught a five and a half pounder. Uh, the next day, I thought we had the winning spot. Next day, we went there. Joel cracked a six and a half. I caught a four, and I still have never got a bite there since. So they moved, but it was a spot I never knew was there, and it was active. Man, it was very active. There are some walleyes in here too, but for the most part, those are a bunch of smallies. So again, finding something 
finding, you know, I want to, I put things on a point system. I've talked about that before in the webinars we, I do with Seth. Uh, point system's huge for me. You know, what am I going to stop on? There's fish everywhere. So I want to hit stop signs. Uh, I want to find stuff like this dump and this rock. All good. You got a main river channel. We know river channel, creek channels, all those feed life into an area. Uh, moving waters coming through. And then I got bait. I got fish. Once I start seeing all that kind of stuff, vegetation, Anything that it is, I start adding up a bunch of points. Next, you know, I got four or five points, and that might be a pretty good spot to stop and fish. So environment, super huge. Again, here's another environment. You know, this is a big old school perch, um, and these are small. He's underneath the perch eating them. Actually, they might even be walleye on this screenshot. I can't quite remember. I do remember this screenshot. I remember fishing for them, and a lot of times I noticed that they were walleye that were actually following these schools of perch. So I can't remember if they were or not. Um, but they're actually right up in there. You can see right here where it's starting to get a little bit black. It's actually uh, those fish are in there eating and breaking up that that uh, bunch of perch fry, basically. Uh, here's a stump. You can see it clear as day. Down scan will show that to you. Sonar probably wouldn't have showed that to me as well. It would have kind of put everything here together in one big sonar echo reading. In this case, uh, I caught it on down scan. It's clearly a stump. It just sits there right here on a little little ledge before it breaks off pretty shallow and uh these right here are all bass i actually sat there and caught them on a brush hog uh it was pretty cool i think this is chickamauga but i can't quite remember and right here you can see i'm not giving you the waypoint on that stump because that's a pretty good one i caught some big ones off of that one uh you'll notice here i'm using pallet nine uh these days a lot i i change that sometimes i play with stuff depending on what that lake looks like to me but lately i've been really digging palette nine um again just stick with something you know that's one thing i tell everybody stick with something if you're side imaging this day you know i'm using a 3d i can easily shoot 160 feet off each side if i want generally i keep it at about 120 140 100 somewhere in that range but i urge everyone to keep it there because that's how you learn where things are in relation to you if you if you keep it at 100 and you learn on 100 You'll know when you see things off to your right, off to your left on side imaging, you'll kind of have an idea of how far away that is from you when you actually start to turn around and fish it. Now with point one pucks and stuff, I can I have buoys in my boat, but I can't tell you last time I threw one. Um, I know where right where I'm at with GPS, the point one shows me what direction I need to be aiming as to my waypoint that I would have put on that stump, and I can sit back off of that, you know, a good 25 yards, 20 yards, make a cast at that stump, and start pulling all those fish away from it. Uh, here's sonar. Uh, you know, this is a fish in, in the vegetation, and, and again, how I can tell. Here, this is a stock, a cabbage stock right here. Um, it's connected to the bottom, and yeah, it's, it's, it gets a little harder. Maybe some zebra mussels or something in there, but it, it gets a little harder, not, not crazy hard. A uh, little bit of vegetation here, so we got some bait and some cloudier, some lighter stuff. But right there whoop, is a big green dot right there, not attached to nothing. That's a bass. Uh, again, it's just training your eye to, to see stuff like that. And the only way you can do it is by turning it on. So make sure when you're, you're going out there, you're, you're switching through screens. You really can't break nothing. Keep settings in auto. You look, you can see right here, sensitivity auto. I mean, I'm leaving everything the way it comes in the box and that's the image you can see uh fish on timber i'm not sure where my map went on the screen but i actually caught the this these bass right here this is just a big piece of standing timber i mean i almost hit it with my boat if i didn't uh, when i went over the top of it but down here you see these little clutters right there those are bass just hanging at the bottom of that tree trunk um down scan would have showed that good i don't think i have that image i don't um, but again, that's just using my sonar. I'm pretty fluent with them both. I, I like to use them all. And in that case, right there, idle over that tree. And I'd seen a bunch of trees, but I never saw the fish sitting on them. Just like you go to a bass pro shop, look at their fish tank. Uh, you'll see the bass, how they relate to it. They're always going to try to find the cover. Uh, that's just what they do. Whether it's a transition line, whether it's a clump of weeds, whether it's anything. And I got a lot of good screenshots to back it up. But again, that gives them something to hang on. Gives them a place to ambush prey as it comes by. Uh, and here's a school of spotted bass on a rock pile. I mean, rock pile looks like a rock pile when you're looking at down scan, you're looking at side scan. I mean, to me, that, that looks like a bunch of rocks. And up here is a mega lot of spotted bass. Uh, it's an amazing spot, actually. I can get on that spot and I can catch 
uh, those spots on that lake every single time I go there. Um, but again, they can be that, I mean, there has to be hundreds of them there and they are either not being able to catch one or two and then they don't bite no more. Or I can sit there and catch them for two hours. It's just whether their mood's in the right place, but they're always on that rock pile. There really ain't much there. You can see up here looking at the side imaging screen. It's just all sand all around them. Nothing there. It's, I believe that's a man-made rock pile of some kind uh, that was put there probably to help the situation. And here is the exact same screenshot, but looking at my sonar and looking at my map. Uh, you can tell by all the lines. I like that spot. But here it is on sonar. And again, you can see how it kind of condenses and puts everything together. Uh, one rule of thumb when you're comparing sonar sonar traditional sonar and down scan okay this cone right here that we're looking at is action somewhere between 25 and 30 feet how it falls off the edge of that that point that means that my cone that's coming off of that in down scan is going to be the exact same roundness as it is that cone i'm looking through is going to be the exact same roundness as the depth that i'm in so if i'm in 10 feet if i'm in 10 feet deep and i see a fish Somewhere underneath my transducer, that fish is in a 10-foot cone somewhere there. Doable. If I'm in 40 feet or 30 in this situation, somewhere underneath that transducer and 30 feet either way is that same bass. That target zone becomes so much bigger. Hard, hard, a lot harder to target solo fish. Difference in sonar is, is that it's going to be a third. So if I'm in this same 30 foot and I look on my sonar, now we're talking about that bass is somewhere in 10 foot. Big reason why I don't utilize down scan much for um, the deck of my boat when it comes to video game fishing, trying to get on, looking at a fish, you can't replace your sonar. Um, it shows me live time. It, I can tell what the fish is doing, what their mood is in, how big they are. And most important, I know they are literally in a manageable place right underneath the boat. So if it's only 10 feet, that fish is in like 3.33 feet is all that circumference is underneath my trolling motor at that exact time. That's a fish that if I can get my drop shot, if I can get a jig or something down there on that fish, I can catch them. Uh, here's some smallies suspended off of a random boulder out in La La Land. I don't even know if this is what lake that was. I think it was a, maybe Champlain. Um, big old boulder out in the middle of nowhere. How I found it, I don't know. I think I actually found it because I was just running, and I keep one of my sonar transducers in the hull of my boat shooting through the glass. That means I can run 50, 60, even 70 miles an hour in my Phoenix and still pick up bottom. And I can all of a sudden see when it's just normal brown, nothing there, and all of a sudden a quick spike comes through. And if, if you're going 60, 70 miles, it's going to be a really quick spike if you hit it. But still, you'll see that color change real quick. And I, I can't tell you how many times, ask my buddy Chad Smith, who's had to sit there and watch me stare at my graphs for hours and hours, how many times I'm constantly even running in and all of a sudden, whoop, turn back around. I have found spots doing that that way and turn around and end up putting a dot on it. In this case, Here's the boulder, okay? Same boulder, I mean, it's in 40 feet deep. And these are all smallies. They're all sitting up off the top of it. There's some rock bass mixed in with it, but it was mostly smallmouth bass. Same exact image on both. Here you have the boulder. Again, that's only showing me. You can see on down scan here, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plus fish. Here you can only see a couple because again, my cone's a lot smaller. Here I can see the full boulder. Here I'm only seeing some of it. Again, some of that's echoing. It's making it look bigger than it than maybe it is, or it's just it's, it's turbulence. I call it. It's just kind of it knows. It's really hard that rock. And uh, again, I use utilize them both. Get over the top of it, drop a dot on that, and I have that the rest of my life to catch a fish off when I really need it. Maybe even win a tournament on Champlain. Uh, here's bass relating to just an isolated log. This is an awesome screenshot, and this is some I have seen uh, people do or online. I have seen these these tests that they do where they like take a swimming pool and they put in a swimming pool. They put they put like ten bass in the swimming pool, and they're all just kind of sitting in there. They don't really know what to do, and all of a sudden they'll put in you know a, a brush pile in there, and those bass will all congregate to the brush pile. They'll put in some rocks, and those bass will all congregate to those rocks. It's cover. They need to have something to relate to. So bad to where they just painted a black line on the inside of that 
uh, pool and they all those fish sat on that black line. It was one of the coolest things I ever saw. It really changed my views on how I look at fish. And these screenshots show it awesome. This is just like a small piece of timber of some kind. Uh, you know, it could have been from an old ice house or logging when they brought it across. Who knows what it is, but it's just a piece. Uh, it's like a log, a small, a small enough log, but it's barren. There ain't nothing out here. But that one log is holding that many fish on downscan. And here's that exact same image right here. There's the log and here's all of the fish that are just hanging on that. In the middle of nowhere, that's just, you know, spotted bass have that nature, smallmouth have that nature, and they just, they get on something and, and they just hold to it and they make it theirs. And uh, it turns into a party like that. Again, nothing else around but that one little log and look at all the fish that are sitting there stacked on that. You couldn't find that without your electronics, okay? And that is something that you just are never going to find without them. But with electronics, you can find stuff like that all the time. Uh one thing about finding rocks and vegetation is vegetation on traditional sonar will drown out a lot of stuff. You can't really see what's in there. It's really clear. It's like a jungle. It's like trying to look inside the woods at a boulder, but you can't see because there's leaves everywhere and you can't see that it's in there. Downscan will definitely pick this kind of stuff up. And here again, uh, block that out. I know where that rock is. Uh, one of my favorites. I catch big fish off that all the time. On, uh, I think it's maybe it's, it's definitely Champlain. And uh, again, these vegetation, you got all this grass right here. Wouldn't have known it was there, but now I, I saw it on down scan. I have it for life. Definitely, you can tell I'm not showing it to you guys where it is, but that is a good spot. I've caught big largies, like four or five pounders off of that thing. And I've caught smallmouth too. And you can see some of the fish moving around on here. But again, knowing that that's there in the weeds, uh, awesome spot. I guarantee you there'll be something will be spawning on that when I get back there in the FLW Tour tournament here at the, uh, will be, you know, at the end of the season. Uh, here's bass holding on contour transitions. They do it all the time. I see walleyes do it a bunch. Muck, mud, to sand, they love it. They'll sit right on that edges. Smallies are the same way. Here it is. This is just a little bit of a ledge, a little drop ledge here. Um, on down scan, you can see them sitting there, and you can also see them sitting there on sonar. But this was an awesome shot. Here I can pick these up because they're sitting up off of it. But I can't necessarily see these, right? Because they're all rock, but these fish are sitting on it, but downscan still has it. I can see them on downscan. I get that target separation. I can pick those fish up. Uh, awesome little school smallmouth these were. And uh, uh, again, they're just stacked. The whole reef, it was one of my favorite reefs. I couldn't catch them all over. All of a sudden I was going to off the edge of it and I saw them sitting there and turn around and put a whacking on them. It was pretty sweet. Uh, here's a large mouth up, just splitting a big school of, uh, this is just a big school of shag. And again, what I said earlier, that's him. Just a, just a lone warrior right there eating, getting big. That would be an Alabama rig fish. I'm sure of it. Cast that in there and catch that fish. But again, this was probably just a big old bowl before I went over it. Just a big old group of shad, but that fish is in there eating them and he's splitting them apart and, uh, moving that bait around trying to peg off the, the scragglers back there. Great shot. Again, out in the middle of La La Land, it's probably actually a spotted bass now that I look at it. What are you doing? I don't know if a large you'd sit out there. I mean, he probably will, but that smallmouth got, or got spotted bass written all over it. Uh, smallmouth, again, we talked about the weeds, and this is a good, great screenshot for that. Uh, this one actually comes off the deck of my boat because you can see my drop shot <laughs> dropping in. This would be my tungsten weight, and here would be my bait. And I dropped it right down. And look at the reaction I get out of them. That's what I'm saying with real-time sonar. Something I can't get out of just down scan. But right over here, I just got this fuzzy sand grass, fuzzy sand grass all through here. And there's just this little patch of open right there, just a little sand spot. And they're just stacked in there on it. And a drop shot down, you can see. Here's how they start. And as my bait drops down to these fish, they first came up and looked at it. And then they follow it back down until you actually get the bite. And a lot of times I can sit there and I just, I just know I can set the hook by their reaction uh, before I even actually even feel that the fish is there. Uh, again, sonar, real time. I can see stuff with sonar. I, I, my deck in my boat, I can't get away from it. I need to have it. And at the same time, though, I'm also utilizing side imaging and down scan at the deck of my boat, too. Uh, I love shooting off the back. I'm using my transducer off the back. Not real big into putting a side scan transducer on my trolling motor because it just moves too much. Um, my trolling motor is fast moving. My Ultrax, 
but on the back of the boat, I mean, you're just talking, it's just 20 feet away and I can sit there and move my boat around. I always know where everything is. And even when I'm just going through fishing something, I can't tell you how many times I pick up a, a, a little isolated patch of clump of weeds that was there or a weed line kick out or a little turn rocks, some fish sitting off to the side or where, where I'm, I'm on a smally reef, where do the rocks look better? Where do they look not so boring and a little bit better? Uh, sand strips coming in. I can see that kind of stuff. Turn around, start firing into there. So I still utilize both up front, but when it comes to actually attacking things off my trolling motor, definitely using my traditional sonar. Uh, here's a single bass and brush pile. Now in this particular brush pile, I was able to see them on sonar. It's kind of tough to do. You, you can see them because of this cloudiness right here that you're getting. These branches are hard, but they're thin. They've been under the water a long time, but down scan shows them to you clear as day. Here you got, you know, you got kind of a harder bottom. I can tell this is rock. And again, you can see from these greens on here that it, it is rock. And then you got these brush piles. These brush piles are eight feet tall. They come from 16 feet all the way up to eight. But right here is a dot. Now I happen to be able to pick them up here on my sonar too, because again, these brush piles aren't that thick. Uh, I've seen way thicker, but at the same time, sitting down kind of by the trunk of the tree. And I did pick them up on sonar, and this is actually, again, my bait going down there to that fish. You can see he looked, went down and looked at it. Uh, I can't remember if I caught him or not. But that was on down scan, just sitting there, clear as day. You can see him not attached. Again, the brush piles are attached to the bottom. The fish is not. Uh, we talked about uh, <clears throat> fish, I'll, again, the hold to anything. This is a largemouth bass down in Florida. Uh, here's a clump of vegetation coming out of a canal or something like it and uh, just one clump of vegetation sitting there and there he is sitting there clear as day but sonar sonar caught it but even i don't know if my eye about to caught that one right away i might have looked at that as cloudiness i mean i can't see the white underneath it so i know it's not on the bottom i probably would have caught it but it just doesn't look like that great of an image to me and again a lot of that's in just what angle i hit i probably came from uh that side over and this kind of took it up and i just caught that but on down scan that looks like a donkey to me looks good sitting there right off the bottom right on that clump of weeds he's got a rattle trap or chatterbait written all over him that's the majority of my seminar we're doing good on time at 7 42 i'm going to run through a couple real things quick and then we're going to open it up to questions uh for everybody because i know we got a lot of them we got a whole bunch of people on uh you can watch all my all of our webinars again this one i was i went alone on this one seth's a hummingbird user so i this one I'm using Lawrence's. This is my opportunity to talk to all my Lawrence and Avionics peeps out there and uh, give them what they're looking at. Uh, you can check out my webinars on joshdouglasfishing.com. All my videos that I do, uh, tackle fishing videos and webinars, both Seth and I's and this one, will always be up on here for you to view and go back and look at them. We've been doing them for years now. Uh, they're awesome. Again, check them out there. I want to thank Lawrence and Avionics. Again, those are what I'm using. Those are the, all the screenshots came from Lawrence and Avionics. And then a big thank you to Bass Pro Shops. Bass Pro Shops sponsored this webinar for you all. Uh, generally, this is something I would charge for, a seminar like this, or my electronics training on the water. But Bass Pro Shops stepping up uh, with Navionics, along with Navionics, and we're bringing this to you all for free. Uh, just to, again, information, you can't have enough of it. Let's see, last slide, I think. Yep, and here's how you can contact me. Um, find out more about our upcoming webinars. You can go to my website to always find that out. That's joshdouglasfishing.com. And again, I urge everybody, my handle on Facebook and Instagram is joshdouglasfishing. You can DM me there, send me a messenger, or my email is right there below. Any questions you have, I mean, sometimes I'm terrible at getting, getting to them right away if I'm traveling or I'm out there fishing. Uh, I can get to kind of terrible at getting back to people, but I do get back to everybody and I'll sit down and jam them all out. Uh, so please don't be offended if I don't get to you right away, but at the same time, um, I will get to everybody. So please send me those questions and let's get to questions. We got a bunch of them here. So let me start to get through some of these questions. All right. Hey, yeah, let me see. Nope. I got it. Okay, can you outline the advantages of the carbon unit over the Gen 3? Yes, the carbons are awesome. The Gen 3 was two. It's been a little bit since I've had a Gen 3. 
uh, I've been rocking a carbon now for the last two years. Uh, processor, it's got a dual dual processor, um, super fast. The thing's insanely fast. The screen screen is uh, very clear. I can see things that I couldn't see in past before, but really, again, we're talking about a processor, and we're also talking about things like Wi-Fi, stuff like that, the direction that the sport is obviously going because it's the direction that everything is going with electronics. Uh, the, the ability to be able to u- utilize Wi-Fi to be able to download maps right on your right on your deal, update my maps. I can update all my Navionics maps right there from my unit, um, and definitely, you know, uh, uh, the carbon the carbon is a sweet unit. Uh, Gen three is a great one too. So uh, not a total lot different between the two, but Gen three I think added more buttons back to it for when you have got those big bumpy waves and stuff like that, and you're out there sometimes you get on your screen. Uh, but again, I find that real easy, but, uh, carbon is pretty awesome. And y'all really want to pay attention to live the new one that's coming out. Uh, that one takes the cake. I don't have them yet. My boat comes in in a week. I've definitely used them. Uh, I got four of them on their way and I'm super excited to get it, get those things on my boat. I can't talk a whole lot about the things that are coming out on there, but to tell y'all, you will be very, very, very happy with the direction Lawrence is going with those new units. Um, yep. Yeah. He said, I wants to know, here's the next question. Follow up. You talk about the new HDS live. It's awesome. I will tell you one thing about it. Again, I can't get into much about it and I'm still learning a lot of stuff about it. Uh, but what I do know, I can't get into a lot of, but I will tell you it has a quad core processor. It is super fast. I could not believe how quick it loads up everything. And when I touch and zoom in on it, I mean, I'm in on it like that. I can jump through pages in the screen there's they're thinner uh the screen's bigger feels bigger on there because it doesn't have a lot of the side it's a thinner unit and uh crystal clear i mean crystal clear i thought i had it good with the carbons definitely got to check those out let me see here uh thanks for hosting well i appreciate it thank you uh yeah what can we expect to see from the new live again uh I can't get into much. I don't know much. And it ain't that I can't. It's that I want to make sure I'm putting out accurate information. I should have them on my boat. Um, Again, my new boat comes in this week or next week. I should have the units here very soon, get them all rigged up, and I'll be down uh, down in Florida and Sam Rayburn right away after Thanksgiving, putting those things to good use. And uh, I'll probably have to fire up another webinar for us and talk about nothing but live. Um, is there a way to transfer waypoints from the Navionics app to the HDS unit? I believe you can through Plotter Sync. Um, you can do a lot of stuff through Plotter Sync. Uh, I don't do it much just because I'm always saving my waypoints to my unit, so I should know how to do it better, but I don't. Um, you know, if I have a waypoint, if I save something on my map, if I, you know, I'm looking through the app or something, and I save something, I just end up manually punching them all in. But Plotter Sync, you can do everything. You can update your maps. There's so much you can do utilizing Navionics, Lorance, and Plotter Sync. Um, how do you activate fishing ranges on the app? It's currently faded non-active. I think you have to pay for the sonar chart feature for the advanced mapping options. You got to buy advanced mapping options. I think off the top of my head it's $5.99 it comes with a bunch of options that is one of them so definitely make sure you get that that's why you don't have it can I use fishing ranges on my HGS Gen 2 touch thanks Kent Kent no you can't I wish you could um, again that's a Lawrence thing Lawrence doesn't own Navionics uh, so they don't allow it as of right now or haven't turned that feature on is the feature available yes Navionics definitely has it that's why they utilize it on their app um, it could go on to Lawrence units, but that's something that Lawrence has to open up and Navionics, they got to agree to terms on that. Uh, it's way over my pay grade. I'm not sure how none of that works, but I will tell you both of those companies care more about their consumers than you could possibly imagine. Um, I always urge people to simply just send in an email and request it. They don't know you want it until you request it. So I would do it to both. Navionics and Lawrence, when they're sitting down at tables negotiating what they want to do, if they find a need for that and are able to make it happen in the first place, uh, then I, I could see that happening. But again, you have to urge them. They care about consume. They care about their consumers, and they value their consumers enough to uh, take in their input for sure. How do you find creek channels? My Lawrence Gen Three does not have the orange lines. Uh, it does actually, as long as you have a Navionics card in there 
and it is uh, you got to turn on the colored seabed. It's called. It's going to be under highlight the map, your Navionics map, so that orange or yellow bar goes around it, and go to map options. And it's one of those two options. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but there'll be colored seabeds, and you activate that. When you activate that, that'll throw up like that, all that green, like I just had at Sam Rayburn, shows me where the old forests are. So that I know that when I run in there at 70 miles an hour, I might want to, you know, shut her down and idle through there because there's standing timber everywhere. It'll activate the creek channels, all super important. Uh, especially spawning time of year, pre-spawn, those fish are going to move in. They're going to follow the creek channels into those flats. And I just know right where they're at. I can start right on there, start whipping a trap around until I start finding and locating the school bass. So definitely activate your, make sure you have your Navionics card in and activate your colored seabeds and you'll have your creek channels. It'll, it'll throw a bunch of stuff on there. Uh, same question again, creek channels on the uh, HGS Gen 3, same exact question. Uh, by Bill Beer. Bill, make sure you get Navionics card in there. Activate your colored seabeds. Uh, great picks. What are your settings for side scan? Again, I uh, you might have missed this from before. My all my settings are factory outside of palette 13 on my sonar, and I take the contrast off on so on my side imaging. Just and again, they got it good in auto. You don't have to do that, but it's simple, and you can sit there and play with it, and, and your eyes will kind of look at something a little bit different. Uh, you know, sometimes you get to a lake where there's a lot of hard bottom. So I tend to dense that down a little bit. And then in areas where there's not a lot of hard bottom, then I tend to bump it up more to really make it white, really show me that it's there. A place like St. Keller would be a great place to do it. Really kind of show me that those rocks are in there. Uh, what transducers do you feel perform the best with the Gen 3s? Uh, well, up on the front of my boat, I, I don't, I use an Altrex, but I don't use the sonar. I do keep a cable there in case something happens and I break my transducer off, but I just use a, a standard 83200, the little puck one. Uh, I put that on my trolling motor. That's what I use there. I use that same exact one and I, it is, uh, in the hull of my boat. Um, I put it inside and shoots through the fiberglass and that way I can go through weed beds. I keep an image when I'm shooting, uh, when I'm running on pad, I still have an image, all that. I like it when it shoots through, it doesn't get drowned through. And then I'm, I'm on mine right now in my carbons, I'm running the 3d, uh, the 3d structure scan. It's awesome. It's like structure scan on steroids. Uh, that's what I'm using, but even just your standard LSS2 on the Gen 3 would be awesome. Plug it right into the back of the unit, and you're good to go. Question covered. Thank you. Um, wondering which units I should put on my 18-foot crest liner. Two 12-inch HDS Gen 3s, 12-inch uh, Elite TIs, and total scan. No point one. Okay. I would definitely, I mean, it's all budget thing. Okay. I'm always going to tell you to buy as much graph as you can afford. Um, the elite TIs are nice. The TI twos are nice. They really are. Um, but the gen three is a really nice unit too. Uh, it's going to have a faster processor, um, which is big time important. It's going to be a little bit quicker, more functionality. And uh, I would definitely run an LSS2 at minimum on oh, Gen 3. I'd run an LSS2. And you ask about a 0.1, without a doubt, 100 times, yes, you have to have a 0.1 on your boat these days. Uh, I remember the, sitting out on the end of a point, and I didn't know what direction I was, where the water, you know, where the point was. I couldn't tell. Now with 0.1, I always know where I am. It's got an internal compass built right into it. shows the nose of the boat exactly which way I'm going. If I box a fish call, whatever, turn back – put spot lock on, turn back around. I can just look down at my map and see whether I'm aiming right at my spot or whether now spot locks move me, take it off spot lock, swing it back over, make my cast. So uh, definitely buy as much money, buy as much graph as you can afford. Um, and as far as I will tell everyone, I think that I run 12s, uh, might even put a 16 on my boat this year, but I do think that the nines are almost the best bang for their buck. Um, so. Uh, I would maybe utilize that if that helps you in your budget. Uh, hold on, I got another question. Breezy's bringing on a question. 
Uh, Bree, I can't figure out how to ask a question. Can he talk about the importance of density and downscan in 2D sonar? Yes, not all grass is created equal. Yeah, so uh, when I want to see how dense something is, sonar is going to show it to me because it's going to get super, super dense, a lot of color in there. Uh, but again, I definitely look at downscan. I can see the stocks. I can generally tell if I'm looking at milfoil, hydrilla, coontail, just by looking at my downscan and my side imaging. Uh, weeds aren't all created equal. You know, uh, sometimes you want that denser stuff, just like rocks. You want more rocks. Uh, so definitely that. Uh, do I utilize fish reveal? Eh, I did. I did some. I do. I think it's awesome. I definitely utilize it in my electronics trainings when I'm teaching people. Uh, out on the water, which is something I do do. I should tell everybody that. Um, even if you're not in my home state of Minnesota, contact me. Um, chances are at some point in time in the near future, I'll be near your state as long as you're not on the West Coast. Um, most likely, I will be in your state at some time and traveling through and be happy to set up an electronics training with you. Uh, I charge 300 bucks. I jump in your boat with you. We're going to do your settings. We're going to go through everything pimp it all out, and then we're going to go do interpretation stuff. Show you images like what we just looked at, but from your equipment. When we get done, I promise you, your brain will be scrambled, but you will have an awesome idea, a lot better, and you will be way more efficient on the water. So fish reveal, yeah, I use it, um, but I can, I can see fish. I know what I'm looking at with, with that, so I generally don't use it too often, no. Um... Uh, is there a way to set the regular sonar to only show the bottom 15 feet of the water column? Not that I know of. I'm not sure why you'd want to in the first place, but, um, you know, you can see fish come up. I, I think I think maybe I'm guessing that you don't like the clutter up top, and it's just something that I promise you you'll learn to ignore. Just there's not much up there, but sometimes I do want to see. But, yeah, um, no, I don't, I don't think there is, uh, but I've never tried. So but I don't believe so. Is there a way for me to record this so I can try to fine tune my, uh, to record this? No, I don't know if you can record it, but it'll be up on YouTube. You can watch it again. You can keep going back and forth. I'll do it for you. How about that? It'll definitely be up on YouTube or visit my uh, website, joshdouglasfishing.com. Give me a couple days and uh, Breezy will have it all up and ready to go. Uh, I think you can watch them on Navionics too. So go to Navionics.com. You can watch them there. Uh, do I use a different frequency on 2D on the console and front unit? I don't. I keep everything the exact same. I think it's it's spot on. Lawrence is dialed. They're known for their sonar. I've looked at other uh, sonar from other companies, and I definitely think Lawrence is by far running away with their sonar. Uh, nope, I just keep it. I just keep it. My, all my settings are are um, literally, except the couple we went through, they're factory settings. Uh, how do I break down a large submerged grass flat? Great question. Um, I have learned over the years, and my results and tournaments have gone way up because of it to move more water and move more water faster. Um, flats, on the other hand, can be sometimes I used to ignore them, but they're the dinner table, so you can ignore them. You got to get up there. Uh, generally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick my side imager on about, you know, 100, 120. It's a grass flat, so I can't see through the grass too far. So 120 feet on each side is pretty good. And I'm going to move water. I'm going to look at it, look at something different, figure out if there's any creek channels that run through there. Again, uh, looking at the contour that might be on there, if there's a, an old creek channel might not even show a contour change, but it shows you with that colored seabed that there's a creek channel in there. There's definitely going to be maybe a little dip. It might be a five foot flat and all of a sudden it just goes to seven feet. Could be all the difference in the world. But I do want to go along the flat and figure stuff out, you know, um, looking what's out there, trying to dictate the different, you know, you can see where eelgrass looks different than hydrilla. And if eelgrass is what I want, then I can just idolize, idle that whole thing, just start dropping waypoints and dots on my side imager in those eelgrass clumps and know where all that is, what I'm targeting. Uh, but again, if it's just a flat and you've looked at it all and you can't tell nothing different, then pick up a chatterbait and start moving water. Pick up a top water, pick up something, start moving some water or swim jig. And, and sometimes there's nothing better in the world with all this electronics, with all this that money can buy than just good old fashioned 
a uh, little bit of elbow grease getting out there and just going fishing. Um, when marking things on down scan, do you put the cursor on the fish or the bottom? Um, I'm guessing you're asking when I'm marking things on down scan, do you put the cursor on the fish or the bottom? Um, if I'm dropping a waypoint, I just hit the waypoint button somewhere in between the fish and the bottom, I guess. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm going to try to put it on if it's like, I generally am going to put a mark on just a fish, you know, because the fish moves. So I don't want a waypoint on just a fish. Um, I, I might do a temporary one or something maybe, but uh, generally I can just kind of scroll back and turn my boat right back around and then get up on my deck and go find that, that fish again. If he's not moving too much, if he's moving, then, then, uh, you know, I can only guess which way the fish is going to go. So uh, more so I, I'm going to drop dots on stuff that looks good that i think is going to hold fish and when i see something like that then i just put it on it so if it's a rock if it's a clump of weeds i touch that clump of weeds hit the icon i'm big on using lawrence lets you use a bunch of different kind of icons to put on there um and i use you know the grass one for grass a wood one like a tree for brush piles a boulder for rock and so on and so forth so i hope that answered your question uh what bait do you fish when fishing those big boulders and weeds well you know that just depends on what what i'm thinking i'm going to catch there you know if it's a small mall probably a tube i've never met a small i don't want to need a tube it's crawdad and crawdad lives on that looks like crawdad heaven right there uh that fish can get uh, you know uh, if it's a large mouth probably flip a jig on it something like that you know again i haven't met a large mouth that won't need a jig so basically just kind of getting over the top and um getting over the top and uh Flipping something on there, jig worm. Jig worm would be one of my favorites. Just an outcast tackle money jig with a little four inch cinco or uh, um, something like it, and throw that in there. Drop shot, drop shot will work. Uh, or maybe you want to crank it, hit that rock, you know, Timmy Horton style back in like Champlain down in Ticonderoga, trying to hit them, and they're just holding to it. You know, that's what they're going to do. So uh, really, that's all relative to what you're doing, what you're fishing for, and what you think is going to be there. Uh, but a tube and a jig, you're always good. That'll cover largies and smallmouth. Uh, how do I use the range ring to help with your fishing? Kent, Kent, good question. I think the range ring is that circle that's there. I've, I've used it before. Uh, I didn't really love it because I didn't really need it. Uh, range, rig, range ring is meant if I'm – thinking the same thing you're talking about range rings to show you how far away you are from another object coming up uh what i like about lawrence is let's say i have a waypoint creeping up to that waypoint on my deck uh, as i'm coming up there i can just touch the icon and it'll sit there and show me right on the bottom in feet and in miles if you're that far away but in feet as i come right up to it like i said it will do it in miles if i'm doing it from my boat i guess and i want to see how far away i'm it'll show you you know, everyone does it. It's like, how far away am I from this waypoint? Oh, I'm 2.2 and a half miles as crow flies. Got it. But utilize it even more as I'm approaching stuff like that. And I want to know where it is. So I make sure to slow down as I get up there. Being quiet is super duper important. We can take, talk electronics so we're blue in the face, but being quiet on your boat and, and letting your and sneaking in and not letting fish know that you're there is by far uh, even more important. So as I'm coming up, I can touch the icon, the waypoint, and I can see, you know, I'm 200 feet away, I'm 150 feet away, and I'm 100 feet away, 99, 98, so far it's on two, three, you know, and then boom, and I'm on top of it. Uh, so the range ring helps. I, I know people that swear by them. I mean, really good anglers swear by the range ring. Uh, I don't. I utilize, I just touch, I utilize that touch screen uh, for what it was meant to do and be efficient and just tell me exactly how far I am away from the object that I'm coming up to or that I want to fish. Uh, we covered fish reveal. It's a great tool. Uh, I, I use it in all my trainings. I generally don't have it on my graphs, but that again, that's again, you're talking to somebody that has two graphs at his face on both his deck and the, and when I'm sitting down, so, uh, I can kind of utilize all of them. I don't need to overlay things on top of each other. Uh, which transducer do I prefer on my Ultrax? Not the one that comes in it. Again, I talked about this, not the one that comes in it, though I do uh, keep it there and keep it at the ready in case I break off my transducer or something. But I just use the standard 83200, the small pot.
Okay, can you go back to the Navionics map and show how you can determine a hard bottom just by looking at the map? Let's try. Contour. Let's see if I have a map next to this one. Let me move some. Sorry, I got too fast the fingers here. That's the one I want to look at. Oh, there's no map there. Hold on. Basically, what I'm looking for is contour. Contour changes. I got to find an image here with a map with the sonar at the same time, though. To back up. Bear with me. I would like to show you. With contour, tight lines, tight contour lines, one foot contour, they're gonna sh something's going to be hard there. I don't know if I have a good screenshot of that. Now that I'm looking here, marking fish. Oh, here's one. Again, contour gets tight. If they're spaced out like it is here, this is all the mud basin out here. There ain't nothing out there. It's just slow waved contours. They just moved slowly as it came up here onto this reef, this hard point. It says, I think it says hard point right there. As it comes onto this, all of a sudden, these contours get really, really tight. So here I'm coming off of it and you can see it's because there's rock there, it can't move. So I'm looking at my map and I'm looking at my contour and that's gonna kind of tell me areas to start to look for hard bottom. So hope that helped. When I run my sonar and down imaging at the same time, I get a line along the bottom on my down imaging. How do I eliminate that? Um, I've seen that before on, uh, there could be multiple reasons for it. I've seen it a lot when I'm doing electronics trainings, especially on tin boats. I'm not sure if you got a tin boat and the way the engine sits, you know, we have jack plates and stuff on our bass boats, pushing that engine back away from it. Sometimes it could be something as simple as the transom of your engine that you're catching the transom of your engine with your, uh, down imaging and side imaging transducer. That's also sitting right there next to it. So with the, the big big atlas jack plates that were running keeps it kind of back so i don't really I'd never have that problem but what you could you could trim up and i bet you that eliminates it it also could be something like a ladder or something off the back of the boat that's just in that that, that that's what it's hitting i'm guessing that's what you're referring to i've seen it before usually playing with your trim trimming up generally gets rid of it you may need to consider moving your actual side scan structure scan down scan transducer to a little bit better spot but again i, I wouldn't know without actually seeing yours it's just an idea of, of maybe what it could be that's eliminating that Uh, hi, Josh. Do you feel the waypoints that you mark on your graph are accurate within three feet or more than three feet off target? How do you handle waypoint management for accuracy of cast to the spot? Terrific question. Uh, no, they're not. The military will, I mean, they're accurate. They're accurate within feet. They're really close. But it depends on where the satellites are at that current time. Uh, my good buddy Brad Leiferman went through this whole thing with me once and really explained it real good. And I also had, doing a guide trip this year, I had two guys that were in the Air Force. They probably have stuff in the Air Force that they can get uh, dead dead like that. But at the same time, uh, I don't think the military ever wants us to get that accurate um, to be able to do something like that. So we're always within the satellite range. Some days I notice a little better than others. Uh, I definitely notice that I can be off within a few feet. Um, depending on how I get on, come at something and what angle I came at it. And also where I dropped the waypoint from compared to where my point one puck was at the same time. I mean, that's what it's pinging off of. So I keep my my map, it sits basically right behind me, or I'm sorry, my, my point one puck sits right behind me. My transducer's on the back and my front graph is 20 feet away from that. So it's kind of like a good buffer zone, but you'll never be you're never going to get within inches. You know what I mean? Like you just, within feet is good enough. I mean, I can't make an accurate enough cast to hit within inches anyway, offshore, something like that. So you're within feet, but it changes throughout the days with where the satellite is, as the earth spins, it's a whole thing that I'm good at finding fish, man. I'm not very good at all that technical stuff. Um, but at the same time, yes, they're accurate. No, they're not as accurate as we'd all like them to be. 
but they're pretty dang accurate, man. I mean, they're, they're right there, but sometimes, and that's, you know, being able to see in the front of the boat, stuff like that. They got coming out side imaging off the side, different things like that all helps just pinpoint exactly where you're, where you're going, making sure you're zoomed in on your map. Uh, all that kind of stuff will definitely help with it. But no, the, no, you're right. The, and it changes. Some days I notice that they are dead accurate. Other days it might be off by a couple feet. Uh, it's just kind of how it goes. Um, how far can you on an LSS tra uh, two transducer shoot accurately? Um, also, what's the shallowest you can use one and still be effective? Okay, there's a big difference, not a giant, uh, yeah, pretty good difference between LSS two and the 3D. Um, 3D has functionality on it, uh, but it also like gave the side imaging steroids. So um, when I was using LSS2, I want to say I was shooting mostly 80 to 100 feet on each side, even sometimes 60. I know you can do more than that, but with contour changes constantly and vegetation, we're bass fishermen. Uh, depending on how shallow you are, you can't see past something anyway to a certain extent. With the new 3D, I don't know if I'm ever under 100, and I'm usually shooting at about 120, 140, 160, something like that. Uh, again, now I'm in the business of trying to find fish and find fish fast. So I'm shooting farther, and I'll break down with my rod and reel, and I'll get tighter and then use sonar and down scan as I get over the top of something. But I want to do big swaths, just come through and just be able to see big areas. Uh, so I'll... LSS2, let's call it 80. 80 is a good number. And, uh, you know, once you're in the 3D, you can definitely do more than that. Uh, Dale asks, what is your method of managing trails? I, <laughs> I know a lot more people that manage trails a heck of a lot better than I do. I really don't manage trails. I, I every now and then, like on the Mississippi River, if I'm at a place that's real sketchy to run, once I figure out that I can safely run, I will change and create and save a new trail with a totally different color, like pink. Not like the standard black right here that you that, that I use all the time. Um, it'll be a pink one and it'll stay there and it'll be overlaid on my map all the time. So when I need to get out of an area fast, I mean, it's, I'm a tournament fisherman, so I'm moving in and moving out fast. Uh, I want to be able to just jump on that trail, and now I know I'm safe. I know I've, I, I've idled that before probably a couple times. I feel pretty safe about doing it. Outside of that, you know, I've seen people that save trails for vegetation lines and all that, but I just never got in the habit of doing that. Um, weed lines change all the time. Uh, stuff like that. So I don't manage a whole heck of a lot of my trails. But again, I know a lot of really good fishermen that do. So probably better question for someone else. Um, at the same time, I just utilize that black one that just got the black line right behind it. And that just kind of evaporates and go away as time as certain miles go on. Uh, HDS live or carbon? I mean, live, man. I mean, everything's like a phone. Everything's changing so, so fast. There's so much cool stuff coming. That stuff that's cool right away, right off the gate, right when they release them and you can buy them, and then in a year from now. So, um, you know, you can never go wrong with the carbon. Carbon is still new. It's still the active one. They're still selling them. And generally, Lowrance is awesome about uh, doing updates and stuff like that to allow that um I'll, you know to keep servicing the carbon for a long time so they're both good carbon's got a dual processor um and the hds has got a quad core processor so super fast if you thought the carbon was fast the hds live is super duper fast uh, how do you attack deep weed lines with side imaging man i idle i idle the side of the deep weed line it's great for that it's like perfect for it. it's probably one of the first things outside of looking for hard bottom that i'd use side imaging for I get it on the side and I can follow the weed line. I know exactly where it is then. I can follow that weed line. I can look for points, turns, rocks, spines coming out of them, bluegills, all that kind of stuff, bluegill beds hanging off the side, fish sitting on them, whatever. Definitely utilize it. Keep it on one side and just drive as straight as you can, and that'll keep that weed line there. And then when all of a sudden that weed line turns or all of a sudden makes a little point, you can drop dots, turn around, go back and fish all that. Uh, do you go into zoom on your down scan while scanning or after finding a spot? 
Um, I do sometimes. I'm just being hacky, and I want to show somebody something that I didn't think that they saw. You know what I mean? If I see something or if it's something, I'm like, what is that? I might touch it real quick and zoom in on it just to get a better look of it. Um, maybe see if there's a little separation. Man, is that a fish? And see if there's some separation or are those fish sitting off there on the side or are those rocks? I might zoom in a little bit. So, yeah, I look for their shadow. Uh, look to see if they're up off the bottom. I definitely do it. I, I, yeah, it's there. It's a great feature that you can do. So I, I do utilize Zoom, um, but I definitely keep it out of Zoom all the time. If I zoom in, it's just temporary. I just zoom in real quick to look at something specific and then zoom back out. Um, I have Navionics on my iPad, but I have Hummingbirds and was wondering if I can still use a Navionics chip in my graph and still get to use all the features that are associated with Navionics. Uh, yes, of course, Navionics works in every unit. Uh, Right now, except Garmin, I believe. Um, but definitely works in Hummingbirds, works in Lowrance. I know this is a Lowrance screenshots I'm showing you, but again, I'm not sitting here. I'm not trying to sell you on Lowrance or Hummingbird. I don't really care what you use. I'm showing you what I use, what I like, and hopefully that sells itself to you. Again, auto settings. Uh, with the Navionics chip, yes, you can put them in in everything you're seeing here for the most part with Lowrance. You can do it on Hummingbird. Uh, it changes a little bit. Go to Navionics.com, and right there you can see, you know, what what uh, functions you have with different units. It's all different. Um, again, if there's a function that you want, being a Hummingbird user, Hummingbird cares about their consumers. Contact them and uh, send them a simple email, letting them know that you know you're a Navionics user and you want whatever functions those are on those on your hummingbird units would make you a, a happier consumer and hopefully in due time you'll end up seeing those uh, i've never used a fish finder before and just bought a lorance hook uh, how do you adjust the sensitivity i'm fishing from a kayak man i am number one i don't adjust the sensitivity so i'm going to urge you not to especially if you've never used it before uh, I'm pretty good with them and I don't. So uh, I would leave it in auto. And how you do it on a hook, I, I'm not entirely sure. I don't have a hook. Um, haven't played with them too much, uh, but I know they're great little units, especially for a kayak. And they have some pretty awesome functionality in them now. I mean, functionality that probably 10 years ago when I first got into uh, uh, big time bass fishing, um, or just bass fishing in general, I guess, as a, as a competitor, yeah, that hook's probably got as much that in uh, in that unit than my top of the line Lorances would have way back then. So pretty cool, pretty cool little units. Do you need cell cellular to utilize all functions of Navionics apps on the water? Um, no, you don't. No, you need to download the map. And you know, I no, I don't think you do. No, you need what you need to do is it's already on the map. The functionality is already all embedded in there, but you have to make sure to have cellular to download the map. Once the map's downloaded, it's now on your phone, uh, so it's already there. So, like I tell people going to Canada, going out to Mexico, even places in Oklahoma and Rayburn, stuff like that, where I just was, you start to get pretty rural. So, just make sure before you go on your trip, while you're at home, you use your Wi Fi, down, download all that kind of stuff. Uh, your phones, all that. But once you're out of cell service, that will still be there and GPS will still be there. So you'll still have full functionality. Uh, is there any way to watch this after tonight? I missed half of it due to work. Thanks for your time. Great tips. Thank you. Appreciate the compliments. Uh, I definitely urge people to go to work still. That is why I save all these and record them all and put them on my YouTube page, as I said before. And on joshdouglasfishing.com, you can definitely check them all out there. Uh, thank you for presenting this webinar. I learned a lot and enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. On downscan, are you using fish reveal? We talked about that. If you could only have two units, one at the council and one at the bar, what would they be? 12-inch uh, units, 12 or 9, depending on your budget. I'd go with a 12 or a 9. Um, as of right now, HDS Carbons or the Lives are the two that I would use. You're going to get the most functionality. You're going to get everything that's coming is going to go into the, those two flagship units. So I would run, uh, you know, a 9 and a 9, a 12 and a 9, 12, 12, whatever you can afford. But those would be the two units. And if you can afford the 12s, I'm going to say go 12s because you can split the screen up so much more. And you can literally have everything that I have in two units at my face. Um, you can you can utilize right there
Um, you can split the screen up is what I'm trying to say and try to read a question at the same time. Are you using the built-in transducer on the Altrex or are you using something else instead? I've talked about this a couple of times. Uh, I'm not using the Altrex one that's made for a hummingbird. I know it works on Lowrance. Nope, I want a Lowrance transducer. It's very important to me. I use the 83200. It's like a small puck one, and uh, I put that on there. But I do utilize, I do still buy an Altrex that has a transducer and keep it as a backup. Um, I see from your slides you're running 200 kilohertz on your sonar. Well, it's either... 283, 200, and 200 is what we want to use. So use 200. Uh, 200, and I know you can use, um, what's the word I'm looking for? For better separation and stuff. Um, God dang it, I can't. Chirp. You can use chirp too. Um, is fishing ranges the same as depth shading on your unit? No, fishing ranges, colored fishing ranges, is not yet on any units, only on the app. Again, send emails if you want them to be on there. Um, depth shading just allows you to shade certain depths. I still utilize that on the unit some, um, but it doesn't have all the cool coloring and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's just more basic. Uh, yes, that's a great question. When going from clean water to dirty water, do you need to change the contrast? I feel like you do. Um, and that's exactly why I'm changing my contrast all the time for depth, water clarity, uh, all that different kind of stuff. It's, it's minimal. It's going to be minimal. But again, I'm, I'm changing it just to suit my eyes. Benny, you're the man, by the way. Uh, Lake Master to Navionics and a Hummingbird, what's your thoughts? Okay, you're a Hummingbird user, so you can use Lake Master and you can use Navionics. Uh, there's functions Lake Master has that Navionics doesn't because Hummingbird owns them. Uh, there's also a lot of functions that Avionics has that Lake Master doesn't. So um, well, I'm going to return it right back on a question to you. Um, though I am a diehard Navionics sponsored angler, running around on a Navionics wrapped boat, if I was you, I would utilize both because I cannot pick one crankbait to do the job and cover me. I can't pick one fishing pole to do the job. If you have them both, utilize them. You know, Navionics definitely has more maps. Um, but then there's times where hummingbirds got a better map, you know, and if you can utilize that map, uh, maybe it's a fresher one. Maybe Navionics hasn't been there to utilize it in a while. Um, whatever. There's certain functionality works with just hum hummingbird and lake master and different ones for Navionics and hummingbird. So definitely I would urge you to use both. It's a no brainer. Uh, do I use Fish Reveal? Again, a lot of questions on Fish Reveal. Yes, Fish Reveal is awesome. Um, use it with my electronics training, stuff like that. But generally on these screenshots, no, I'm not using it all that much. I have a sonar and a down scan right at my face. Uh, SS455 or 800? That's a good question. Um, depends. 455 if I'm in shallow, weedy vegetation. Uh, most all of my bass fishing, I'd run 455. Uh, I would use 800 if I'm like deep water walleye fishing, deep water smallmouth fishing. Uh, it's more of a condensed, cleaner pitcher, but doesn't feel like I can't get more underneath me. It's a tighter cone than it is uh, out. So 455 for most all of your bass fishing. If you're out in buffalo drop shot and stuff, uh, go to 800. I'm only going to take a couple more of these questions because we are starving and we're already pushing 830. Please, I'll get back to more of these. And if I didn't get to any of your questions, um, send them. Send me an email, josh at joshdouglasfishing.com. Or again, hit me up on Instagram, Josh Douglas Fishing. If you don't follow me, you should. And Facebook, Josh Douglas Fishing as well. When picking up fish on your side scan, are you only looking for fish in black portion of the cone? Or do you see them outside? Oh, no, I see them in both. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of times it's a little white dot off the side. I, I don't, I can't recall any of these images that show them easily. Uh, I'll add that to my next webinar. If you send me an email, I'll send you a couple screenshots that you can look at to show that I can definitely pick them up. It just depends on what's out there. If it's a lot of weeds, I'm not going to see them. If it's a ledge on Kentucky Lake, I'm going to see them clear as day. So it just kind of depends on what's all out there and how far they're sitting up off the bottom. Will the Structure Scan 3D still be used with HDS Live? I'm guessing yes. I know they got 
some other stuff too. I, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to do all that. Um, not privy to that information. I'm sure we'll all know very, very soon. When breaking down a new lake and side scanning, what speed do you idle around to get the most efficiency versus image quality? Awesome, awesome question. Um, I generally am idling my G2, Avenue G2, idle four, five, six mile an hour. Just depends on how boring everything looks to me. I'm probably going that speed. Once I see something I really like, I start to slow it down to two to three miles an hour. And if I see something that I really, really like and I want to get a good look, I'll just click back my uh i'll just i'll just click it back and just go into idle mode and just literally go right over the top of it as slow as i can the slower you go the better image reading you're going to get your seminars are awesome thanks for taking the time to do them i really really appreciate that bill thank you question covered um i'm gonna go one more how do you why do you guys put a point one um, in the front and back. Also, why do you guys put two up front? I don't. I don't know. I've seen that. Um, actually, I was always told I can't put it by my engine or my trolling motor because of the magnets and the internal compass will throw off at the engine. I use 1.1. I put it right behind my seat at my driver console is where it sits midway in the boat, kind of best of all worlds. People. Um, somebody answered a question for me. Brent Haim said you can focus on the bottom of the 2D sonar by hitting zoom on 2D highlighted screen. Split screen, but whole screen. Uh, yeah, so you can zoom in. That would be a good way to focus. If, if, if that's what the question was, especially the one in the bottom, ignore the top 15. Uh, I maybe took that that you won't, don't want to see the surface clutter, but you can definitely zoom in on 2D sonar as well, uh, for sure. Um, Man, this is a technical question, and I know everyone thinks I'm very technical. I'm not. People got to fix my stuff. People hook my stuff up, but I'm just really good at breaking the stuff down and knowing what I'm looking at and teaching people even better. So uh, someone asked 3D installed. If I add live, which has it built in, will 3D SS still network? And that is something that they're doing. I know they're getting away from the 3D box with that unit, but I, I'm not yet sure. I don't want to answer those questions until I have my own unit and I know how to answer them. Uh, do you have the info on the new one we talked about live? Uh, on your new boat, are you doing dual 12s? Then we're talking. Let's talk about the new boat, the new Phoenix. Are you doing... Um, I am contemplating right now. I run two 12s at my face and two 12s at my deck. If I, I, I really only run the two up, up on my deck, uh, when I'm deep fishing, once the deep part of the season comes spring, I only run one. I can split up the screen however I want. I'm highly considering running the two 12s at my face and a 16 up front, maybe still a 12, uh, come small season. I haven't decided yet. Uh, I'm very much thinking about putting that big 16 up there uh, on a Kong mount and uh, rocking with it because I had one on for that video shoot with that we did with Lawrence uh, with the new live that's coming out. Uh, they put one of those on my deck and I did not want to give that thing back. So I'm kind of thinking I might run a 16 for the first time on this new this new boat when it comes in. Uh, yep, the question thing working. Uh, why is Lorance better than Hummingbird? I know the political answer is they are both good. However, why do you feel Lorance is better? I got no problem answering that. I, I'm not in the business of I will never tell you uh, something isn't better than mine. I don't really know much about Hummingbird because I've been a Lorance user since from the day. Uh, being a Navionics guy, though, I definitely have to know some stuff about Hummingbird because Navionics works in there and you got to answer questions like this. Uh, I think Lorances are faster. I know they're faster. Um, and I think they're easy to work out of the box. I like the settings that are there. I like the functionality. The touch screen is super fast. Um, you know, Hummingbird's got some some nice options that come with it in their whole system, uh, things like that to look at. I know Lorance does too. Uh, again, it's Ford to Chevy. I'm a Chevy guy. So I don't like Fords. Um, Hummingbird, they're good units. Can't argue with it that some of the best in the world use them. Uh, but a lot of classic champs keep getting these Lorance units. 
uh, and keep winning classics. For me, they're easier to use. I feel like the sonar is better. I like the mapping. It's just what I've been used to. And now I'm just privy to some of the information too that's coming out and what Lawrence is coming out with in the next year or two. And I just, the direction that Lawrence is going is very much in the direction that I want to see that com the company go to. So for me, uh, I'm not giving you the political answer. All these units are awesome these days, uh, but in my opinion, Lawrence is the best. Yes, I use side scan around weed lines. We talked about that. Last question, for real. Uh, last question. When you get your new boat rig, do do a YouTube walkthrough explaining the what and why, what you learned in past installs? I will do that. That wasn't a question, so I'll do one more. But thank you for that, JW. I will definitely do that. Uh, uh, this question right here. Oh. Yeah. And uh, is there anything specific you look for on mapping to find smallmouth on Erie? I look for rocks. They got cool rocks on Erie, uh, glaciery, weird flat rocks, crumble off, big rocks off the side of them. Uh, I can see the fish there, um, definitely. Uh, but I'm looking for rock, and I'm looking for fish, and uh, that's what I'm looking for, clean water. I, I like that when I'm fishing for smallmouth. Uh, that's it for this. I'm going to drop the questions from here. I'll try to run through some more of these. If, if I didn't get to your question, if I didn't explain it the way you wanted me to explain it, please, by all means, contact me. Again, Josh Douglas Fishing is my handle on Instagram and Facebook. Josh at joshdouglasfishing.com is my web is my email and joshdouglasfishing.com is my new website we just put together. I want to give a big thank you to Bass Pro Shops, um, Navionics for allowing this webinar to go out to you all. Uh, big, big, big thanks for uh, Hunter's Point, Nitties, Hunter's Point. Um, oddly enough, the internet at my house is terrible for the next month until they put the fiber optics down. I live up in rural Minnesota, but if I like Mille Lacs and this, I couldn't, I can't even barely update my Instagram feed some days. So they let me use this awesome house that we're in right now. It has super snappy uh, 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 internet for me to be able to do this. So big thanks to them. And then again, Bass Pro Shops, uh, Navionics got behind this, Lawrence, everybody. And of course, all of you, I can't believe how many we got to come on for this. Eager people looking for more information, still hanging on right now to hear me just go away from it. And a big thanks to Breezy D Media, AKA used to be known as the Fisherman's Widow. Now we roll around in a Lance camper, so she's always right next to me. She's the furthest thing from a widow now. Uh, she gets to smell my fish slime on the daily basis. But trust me, I can't put these things together. Bree definitely does them. Uh, and does a great job at doing them, bring them to you guys. So again, any questions, hit me up, guys. I love you all. Thank you so much. Tight lines. We'll see you guys soon. See ya.